Hi, welcome to this presentation on checkout optimization, where I will be showing you a select number of core findings from Baymart's 30,000 hours of large scale e-commerce user experience testing. Specifically, we'll focus on the checkout flow and we'll try to simplify the checkout flow by showing you a concrete example of how we can reduce a checkout flow from 16 form fields all the way down to only 8 form fields. And in this process, I'll show you our findings on how users behave when they reach certain form fields in the checkout flow. My name is Christian Holst and I am the co-founder and research director of the Baymont Institute. And before we start, just to give you a sense of where we are in Baymart's 30,000 hours of large-scale e-commerce user experience testing. Uh, if you have Baymart Premium Access, uh, what we'll be covering here is within the topic card and checkout, and then specifically within the, uh, within the topic customer and address information. And the agenda for today is a number of different items. Firstly, quickly covering why checkout length matter. Then secondly, covering how checkout length matter, because this is often misunderstood. And then uh, you can say the meat of it is getting from 16 form fields down to eight, showing you uh, the exact test findings. Firstly, let's talk a bit about why checkout length actually matters. So the reason most of us care about checkout length is because most sites face this challenge. Most sites face this challenge that 70% of users who put something in their cart end up abandoning. So at Baymont, we have uh, studied the exact cart abandonment rate for a number of years, uh, around nine years now, uh, and we have compiled this average of average of averages. Uh, it's a meta study, if you will. Uh, so it's the average of 41 different studies that also examine averages across hundreds, if not thousands of e-commerce sites. Uh, th so this is very much a global average, and your number may be somewhat lower, 50%, 60%, it can also be higher. Uh, what's important to remember here is that while you can have a 60% abandonment rate, which in direct comparison would look good, it might not actually be that great because how pre-qualified the traffic you get on your site is, how pre-qualified they are for already actually purchasing greatly determines uh, how much it takes to actually make them abandon in the checkout flow. So if users are very, very pre-qualified, uh, before they even arrive at your site, and your site, by the way, is the only site in the world that sells the particular product they really, really want, then you can get away with a quite horrible checkout flow uh, compared to uh, a site w that predominantly get um, traffic that's not very pre-qualified uh, and where the product type is much more of an impulse purchase. So it's just to say, even if you have a lower number, it doesn't mean you have a perfectly optimized checkout flow. So let's look at something else. Let's look at why users actually abandon, um, because this is uh, often far more interesting. So the majority of users who abandon checkouts usually abandon because they're not ready to purchase. That segment is really not that interesting when we talk about checkout optimization. That segment is interesting when we talk about product details, pages optimization, and general uh, product exploration and product finding. Um, but that will not cover in this presentation. If we focus only on the checkout flow, those users who abandon because they haven't actually decided to purchase or be persuaded into purchasing aren't that interesting. Those we really want to focus on are the users who actually abandon doing our checkout flow while actually wanting the product, but abandons for other reasons. So we have obviously examined this at Baymart across multiple years. Um, and we, the, most, uh, the most latest numbers are these of overarching reasons for why users abandon doing the checkout flow. So the numbers here represent how many users have in the past three months or, uh, abandoned one or more orders solely for any of these reasons. And for this particular presentation, there are one of these that really stick out, and that is it is 26% of all users that in the past quarter have abandoned one or more checkout flows solely due to a too complicated checkout process. When I show this number, for instance, at conferences, people often have a following-up question, which is then, 
all right, so if it's because the checkout flow is too complicated, what is then the ideal length for a checkout flow? Before I answer that, let's look at how long our checkout flows actually. Do you know how many steps your own checkout have right now? I can tell you how long the average checkout flow is because we have measured this across many, many years. So we started measuring it back in 2012. In 2012, the average checkout flow for the largest e-commerce sites, the very largest e-commerce sites, the 50 or so, were 5.08 steps. And that includes the card step because in the mind of the user, when we talk about checkout length, they will often count the card step as being part of the checkout flow, at least when we talk about length. So because users perceive it the, uh, that way, we at Baymart also count it that way. Another very important aspect here when talking about how we even measure or define the number of checkout steps is that if users see a new page in a checkout flow that contain uh, or new view in a checkout flow that contain form fields, have new descriptions and a primary button they can click in order to then proceed to a new view, users will perceive that as a step. The reason I mentioned this is that there is a very uh, uh, popular design pattern in checkout flows or overall layout, and that is an accordion layout, where technically the page might be set up as a one single HTML page, but it have multiple sections that collapse and expands to reveal different form fields. That's a concept of an accordion style checkout flow. Some Industry professionals refer to these as a one-step checkout. That's really cheating yourself because in the mind of the user, this is not a one-step checkout. Even if it's hosted on a single HTML page, if there are multiple sections with different form fields that users have to submit via primary button, which then reveal a new set of form fields in a new view with a new primary button, users will count that as individual steps. So if you have an accordion, you have to count each of those as actual steps. All right, so with those definitions in place, let's look at where we are today. In 2019, when counting largely the very same sites, the 60 largest sites in the world, how long are their checkout flows now? Let me show you the number. 5.1. No change. No change whatsoever. Across seven years, let me actually show you how it breaks down and also include the 2016 numbers. So this is how, uh, uh, how many st checkout steps the average e-commerce site have. So the darkest blue color here is 12, then we go into 16, and then we go into 19. And as you'd see here, there is a number of things that are happening. Uh, to the left-hand side, you'd notice that there aren't really that many true one-step checkouts or very few step checkout flows. Those are actually uh, on decline. And then on the other end of the scale, eight and nine steps, those are actually also disappearing. The really big shift or big involvement, even though the average is still the same, uh, the big involvement here over the past seven years is that there is a tendency for longer checkout flows, at least among some e-commerce sites. As you, If you look at the uh, column for six checkout steps, you'd see that uh, from 12 to 16, it actually doubled. So when looking at these numbers, you might wonder, what is going on here? Don't the world's 60 largest checkout flow get that it's an issue to have a very complicated checkout flow? Well, what we have found uh, across all of our testing is actually something that at first sound slightly counterintuitive, and it is the number of checkout steps, if we focus only on the number of checkout steps in a checkout flow, does not have a consi consistent and direct correlation uh, with the checkout user experience performance and the checkout conversion rate. What's far more important is what users have to do at each of the steps and how they're asked to complete those tasks compared to how many steps there actually are. Because that is the real task that users have to overcome. Then you might say, well, um, haven't I seen some AP split tests where they went from a five-step checkout to a, say, three-step checkout and it improved conversion? Yeah, you probably have. And if you go back and look at the version A and version B, you will see that a lot of other things also changed in that redesign. 
Some form fields went from required to optional. Some form fields was possibly removed. Some form fields got a new description or a better example. Uh, other things were, were clarified in the checkout flow, representing what users actually have to do. What we do see to have a very direct impact on the checkout UX performance and conversion rate as well, or you could say in, in terms of lowering the checkout abandonment rate, is the number of form fields we have in a checkout flow. Because this represent the actual tasks that users have to complete. So when we talk about checkout length, we really need to talk about the actual amount of form fields. So I've actually, let's move on to the next step here, which is directly related to this, and that is how checkout length really matter. So it's the form fields we predominantly want to focus on. So here I have uh, plotted the checkout user experience performance. That's up the graph and out we have uh, the number of form fields, so 10 form fields, 15 form fields, 20 form fields in the checkout flow. And each of these dots represent one of the 50 largest e-commerce sites in the world and their performance. As, as you'll see, there is a correlation, be correlation between uh, checkout UX performance and the number of form fields. So the real question we should ask ourselves is not how many steps you have in your checkout flow, but rather how many form fields do we have in our checkout flow? So I'd actually want to ask you, do you know how many open text form fields you have in your checkout flow? If you don't, I would strongly encourage you to actually uh, go in and count that. I can tell you how many form fields the average checkout flow have. The average checkout flow have, among the largest e-commerce sites, almost 13 form fields. Some historical numbers here. This is in 2019. There is actually a small improvement here. Since 2016, this number have actually decreased by almost two form fields, or by exactly two form fields. Because in 16, the average checkout flow, testing the very same sites, had almost 15 form fields. So there is actually a reduction in the complexity of checkout flows and in the length when we talk about form fields. But 12.8 is actually quite a lot because that's the average. And the interesting thing is that this could be just seven form fields. The lowest we can theoretically go is between six and eight form fields in our checkout flow for a physically shipped product. The exact number depends slightly on what country you serve. But let me show you what a typical checkout experience would look like. A typical checkout experience that have uh, somewhere around the average would be something like this. Your exact fields might be slightly different than on this site, but this is quite representative for the typical typing task that users are presented in the checkout flow. Then obviously, there are sites that are vastly below this and there are sites that are vastly above this. So just to show you how horribly wrong it can go, let me show you this. This is from Dell. 45 form fields in the checkout flow. This is obviously a highly intimidating experience for users. But in our large scale testing, we also see a completely different breed of checkout flows, if you will. And it's checkout flows like this. Eight form fields. This is the entire checkout flow for guest checkout, including the payment uh, fields. Eight form fields in total. So my point here is that we really need to focus much less on the number of steps and much more on the number of form fields. It's much more important to get down to around eight form fields than discussing whether they, those eight form fields should be split across two steps, three steps, four steps. In this process of reducing the amount of form fields and simplifying our checkout flow in this way, we find that most sites will often not have one or two magic bullet solutions. The notion that there is such a thing as the Ten Commandments of Checkout UX is really nonsense. It's not at all what we have seen in our nine years of testing checkout flows in large scale. 
Not at all. What we see is that the average e-commerce site in order to actually optimize their checkout flow nowadays need to perform a long array of smaller improvements to all of the form fields and all of the pieces of information in the checkout flow rather than applying five to uh, ten bigger changes we see the actual uh, site would most often need around 30 to 50 smaller changes to the checkout experience and it is those smaller improvements that collectively add up to a seamless and enjoyable, somewhat enjoyable at least, checkout experience that is as simple as possible. We actually uh, count the uh, amount of current live checkout usabilities, checkout usability issues on, on the 60 largest e-commerce sites in the world. And the average number of usability issues only in the checkout flow on these sites is currently 39. So there are 39 usability issues in the production checkout flow for the 60 largest e-commerce sites in the world on average. Just again underscoring, it's not so much about f five big changes, it's usually uh, a lot of smaller tweaks that we have to apply. And with that in mind, let's get started on actually trying to optimize the checkout flow. So let's try to actually go from 16 fields down to eight fields. And in this process, I'll show you our research findings uh, and focus quite a lot on what is the underlying user behavior when users reach some of the input types we have in our checkout flow, rather than just showing you what the solution is. Because at Bayman, we believe it's actually more important to understand the underlying issue and underlying user behavior than the exact solution. So let's start with a checkout flow that have 16 form fields. It could be something like this. First name, last name, email, phone, address line one and two, a company name, a city name, then a postal slash zip code, and then some kind of region indicator. In the US, that would be states, but uh, state, region, or county. Then country, coupon code, credit card number, security code, password, and repeat password. So those could be the 16 form fields. Again, your exact form fields might vary a bit, but it would usually be around these 14 to 17 form fields. So let's start from the top, the name field. So when users reach the name field in the checkout flow, we often see an issue that occur. And it's, it's this issue we often see in testing. And here I have a video from a large-scale eye-tracking study we did. Uh, before I play the video, uh, if you haven't looked at eye-tracking data before, uh, then the red dots here indicate where the user fixates on the screen and the size of the dot it uh, indicates how long the user uh, have fixated at this exact point. And this user doesn't have any kind of disability with their eyesight. This is how most normal users actually scan web pages. Also notice how many fixations they have and how fast they're actually scanning the page. So let's play the video here and see how, I would say, what is quite representative for what happens for a subgroup of users when they try to complete the name fields on, uh, or, or in, in a checkout flow. So the user progressed to a name field and then the user type their name, Jessica Newman, and then move on to the next field. Only as they see the next field, they realize, oh, go up and scan the first one and see, oh, it's called first name. And then they take the last name, they also input it there and cut paste into the next field. And then as they cut paste that into the next field and progress to, th to the third field, they go back, scan it and see, oh, that was for the middle name and then cut paste it down to the last name. Quite a lot of friction for something that's very simple, actually just typing your name, or should have been very simple. We see this happen surprisingly often. It also, by the way, happens on sites that do not have a separate middle name field. There is obviously one uh, less opportunity uh, for, for errors there, uh, but we see that this friction also happens on sites that don't have a middle name field, where users simply type their full name in the first name field. And there are many reasons why we see this behavior. Firstly, what we see very consistently in 
our eye tracking tests of checkout flows is that generally, not just for the name field, but generally users afford a disproportionate amount of attention towards open text form fields. That is, when there are open text form fields on a page, they focus intensely on those open text form fields, often as the very first thing. Then they often have a hunch of what they're supposed to uh, complete here. Quickly glance over the header, not reading, or sorry, uh, over the form field label, not necessarily reading it at all, just glancing over it to confirm their assumption of what are they supposed to input here. And then sometimes, and only then, after this, they may scan other pieces of information on the page, like a big header in capital letters uh, that comes tertiary to the form field and the form field label. So just really understanding here that if they're open text form fields, that is the first thing users will look at before looking at the actual form field label. That's one part of the issue. Another thing is that we see in testing that most users generally perceive their name as a single entity. So they perceive their name as Jessica Newman and not first name Jessica, last name Newman. The latter is a very uh, engineering approach of, of thinking of, of your name. So we see most users think of their name as, as Jessica Newman, at least when asked in the context of where you live. And hence enter their entire name in the first name field. Again, when, over, when only glancing over the page and having a rough assumption of I'm supposed to uh, provide my name as part of this shipping address or placing this order. So that's the issue we observe in testing. And by the way, if you go into your web statistics, you will not see this actually leading to a lot of validation errors because most users will notice this as they progress to the last name field and then go back and correct it. So this will typically not be something you actually see in your error logs because users will typically correct this mistake before actually submitting the page. But that doesn't mean that it's a lot of needless friction for a very, very simple task. So that's the issue we observe in large-scale testing. Luckily, there is also a, another design pattern that we observe in large-scale testing that completely address and alleviates this issue. And that is to use a single full name field. Here you see two examples. The left one is from Wayfair and the right one is from Amazon, where they simply ask the user of their full name. And if we have an average of around 13 form fields, removing one of the name fields responds or corresponds to actually around a 6% reduction in the number of form fields for the entire checkout flow. So it's not that this alone will make or break your checkout flow, but it is one of those 40 smaller improvements we have to make. And this one then furthermore happens to align better with users' perception of their own name or what their own name even is, reducing some um, fiddling with going back and forth between a first name and a last name field. And again, it also removes or simplifies the checkout flow just a bit. So it's one step in the right direction. And then this is actually also a much more flexible way of supporting middle names and titles and suffixes and prefixes, which, if they are separate inputs, can actually uh, uh, be quite a lot. As you saw here in the prior example, uh, they actually also had a title dropdown. A full name field will also be able to uh, allow us to remove such uh, 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 additional inputs. So a very simple design pattern. Then a common concern we often hear here is that there is actually a cost to doing this beyond just the design and development uh, change. There is a cost in the sense of data accuracy because if we do this, ask users for their full name, then the cost being would typically then be that we would need to programmatically split what users type in this form field into two different cells in our database so we can still approximately approach users by their first name or their last name, for instance, in email marketing. So in email marketing, if we want to address users by their first name, hey, Michael, how are you doing? See all the great things we have on offer here. If we want to do that, then we programmatically need to split the user's input. This will obviously not have 100% accuracy. But we see it's often not completely unrealistic to get 
significantly above a 90% accuracy in actually splitting this data out in your backend. So it's certainly not all users that would be wrongly addressed. Furthermore, if you actually think right now you have 100% accuracy because you have a first name field and a last name field, uh, then you're probably also cheating yourself a bit. Try to actually look uh, and, and, and cure your data on first name accuracy because again, users perceive their name as a single ent entity and it's not all users who will correct it as this user did, depending slightly on how many middle names uh, they have uh, and what form fields are actually required in your checkout flow. But yes, there is a slight cost, there is a slight trade-off, and that is in some instances, for instance, if users type their last name first when asked for their full name, uh, the data will be populated wrongly, or wrongly so to say. Uh, you could also argue that if users ask for their full name and they type their last name first, then it's the kind of user who would actually appreciate in an email campaign to be addressed by their last name. But that's another story. There is a sl small trade-off to this. Then let's talk about another type of input we have in our checkout flow. There is a number of inputs like address line 2, at least for uh, B2C sites. Uh, then there are company name fields, also for B2C sites, and coupon fields. These fields c fall in a category we at Baymart call optional minority fields, because it's only a small subset of our users who actually need these form fields but these users really need those fields. As in, just because it's for a small minority of users, we cannot simply remove these form fields. Because if we remove these form fields, then we would lose all orders from this sub subsegment of, of users. So let's look at the issues we see in large-scale testing when users approach these form fields. Let's focus specifically on the address line 2 input because that often causes surprisingly many issues we see. So what we see in testing, again, across sites, across user demographics, uh, across industries, is that when users reach the address line 2 input, we see that it's 30% of users who come to a full stop. And that is of those users with an address line 1 input only. They simply stop and wonder and worry what are the differences between the address line 1 input and address line 2 input. So we see it's 30% who come to a full stop. Then of this group, a smaller group of users actually become so much in doubt that even though they only have an address line 1, a real address line 1 input, they actually start second-guessing themselves so much that they take their correctly filled address line 1 input and move parts of it down in address line 2. For instance, the street number, or sometimes the name, and then leaving the number in address line 1. So actually making a valid input incorrect all of a the sudden. Then you might say, well, Christian, these sites, uh, at least this, those two depicted here, we obviously tested a lot more, um, they don't exactly clarify what you're supposed to uh, actually uh, enter in these two fields. Do note, though, that they clarify, at least the first example here, clarify that address line 2 is actually uh, fully optional. So even despite it's indicated as optional, users still, uh, still doubt themselves. But you could argue that the design here is not that clear because they don't exemplify what is the difference between these two. We've obviously also tested those kind of sites. They often look like something like this. Apartment suite other here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, address line 2, apartment suite, unit building floor, etc. So here, trying to really exemplify what are you supposed to enter here. And while we see this help a bit, it helps mainly on that second subgroup of users, uh, the smallest group who second-guess themselves so much that they actually uh, uh, take their correct address line 1 input and split it out into two fields. That's the main thing it helps on. We see that for the vast majority of users, uh, it doesn't reduce the amount of users very much in terms of who comes to a full stop and actually have to, uh, uh, or think they have to try to understand the differences here and try to resolve the errors. Again, one of the reasons for this is that we see from our large scale eye tracking test that these open text form fields demand a disproportionate amount of attention. 
So even though it's clearly marked as optional, and even though it's actually exemplified what you're supposed to enter here, because it's an open text form field, it will get a lot of attention. And we see that it takes needlessly long uh, and causes needlessly many concerns for those users who don't actually have an address line to input. So that's the issue we observe in testing. There is, however, a design pattern that we see in testing as well to actually resolve this issue or address this issue quite a lot. And that is collapsing the address line to form field behind a link. It would often look something like this, where the address line one form field is obviously displayed by default, but the address line two field is collapsed behind a link. Uh, we see in testing that this removes the vast majority of doubt and friction from actually completing the checkout flow for those users who only have an address line one input. But we also see in our large scale testing, eye tracking tests, that all users glance over these links. They actually notice the links, meaning that those users with an address line two input would be able to locate where they're supposed to enter the address line uh, two. That's obviously a very important detail. Uh, an important thing here in terms of discoverability, important implementation detail to consider is how you actually style this link, because we see that the link should always be placed where the form, full, form field would have otherwise been in the, in the overall address form. And the link, need, the link styling need to indicate that this link doesn't take you to a new page, it reveals additional content within the existing page, because that's a concern that some more novice web users have, that clicking links in the checkout flow, they from past poor experiences and other sites than yours, no, sometimes take you out of the checkout flow and then you've lost everything. So we see that in particular novice users are actually quite concerned on clicking text links in, uh, in a checkout flow. So we need to uh, indicate that this somehow expands additional content on the existing page. And a good design pattern for doing that would usually having some kind of plus icon as seen here. And we see this general principle can be used for uh, almost all optional minority fields. Also, uh, for instance, a company name field would be a minority field, at least on a B2C site. Again, what is a minority field on your site versus average site might change. So you would certainly need to look up uh, your, your past order logs, query those for how many users actually have a valid address line to input, how many users actually have a company name, if it's no longer a minority uh, part of your customers, then obviously you shouldn't hide them behind a link. But it if, if it is a minority, then we can optimize the checkout flow in this way. And that would typically happen for most B2C sites, at least for company name and address line too. Let's talk about another input type. Let's talk about postal code or zip code fields. And actually also talk about region inputs such as states or counties or regions along with city names because we see this part of the address also uh, can cause quite a lot of friction in the typing experience and in the selection experience. So some issues we often, often observe in testing is that city names are surprisingly prone to misspellings and transposed characters, especially when users are typing an address that isn't their own home address, so if it's a gift or they're shipping to uh, another location than their home. Uh, but even when it is their home address, we see that they're still surprisingly prone to uh, at least transposed characters and plain typos. Furthermore, we also see that these region selections, such as a state dropdown, are often needlessly complex, simply because there is often a lot of choice so the selection interface often grow quite tall and complex compared to what it actually is. And the reason I say this is needlessly complex is obviously not because we can remove this. The reason I say it's needlessly complex is because we can auto detect most city and regions based entirely on the user's postal code. That is the whole purpose of postal or zip codes. That is for the postal services to actually, with a numerical value, track a specific uh, city and region. So in almost all countries in the world, we can actually auto-detect both the city and region.
based on the postal zip code. When doing so, we observed very consistently in testing that it leads to vastly fewer typos for city names. It leads to a significantly increased form completion type, uh, time, and it adds uh, just a shred of delight in the checkout flow because most users actually stop uh, or take notice that this site actually made an effort trying to reduce the amount of typing that I have to complete here. And we see that actually uh, reduce the amount of typing by approximately 40% when we do this order detection. So without it, users would have to type their name, address line one, then they have to type the city and make a region selection, and then type the postal code. With it, they only need to type their name, the address line one, and then the postal code. That's a 40% reduction in the amount of address typing in the checkout flow. The way it would look would often be something like this. This is a UX, US example, but similar in other countries. The user here typed the zip code, and when they've typed the fifth digit, an auto detection event is fired and returns the city of Dallas in the state of Texas. That's the general principle here. There are, however, some important notions here. Firstly, it's critically important that when we implement this, we always have a fallback for the order detection event. Because not often, but sometimes, this order detection will not be fully accurate. Even when we use official uh, postal code databases from the postal services, a postal uh, code range might update or a new city name will be added or something like that. For a small subset of users, small, small minority, this order detection event can be wrong, or the return values can be wrong. Therefore, it's critical that we have a mo manual fallback or a manual override where the user can somehow specify their own city uh, and region input. The way it works on this exact site here, the exact way you style that is much less important. The important thing is that you offer some kind of manual fallback or manual override. On this particular site, uh, they return a dropdown uh, which can then actually display multiple order detected values and then always uh, have an option called other at the end, which then reveal two form fields. Another approach of this order detection is that directly beneath the uh, postal code field, you simply inject two open text form fields, one for or, or normal selection fields for the city and region input. So an open text form field for city and typically a drop down for the region. That would also work. But it's critically important you have this. We have had some audit clients who forgot this important implementation detail and actually saw their overall uh, performance decrease after implementing this. And it wasn't because the majority of the users uh, didn't get a, a better checkout flow. It was solely because of that small, small subset of users where the order detection was wrong. If they cannot override it, they will abandon 100%. All of them will abandon because they will not submit an order where the city name or the region name is wrong. So it's quite critical because this may be half a percentage, one percent of users, they will be forced to abandon if we don't have a manual override. Then a small nuance here. This is really if you want to perfect it, but it's actually when we fire this order detection event because there is a tendency for order detection events to be implemented in a way where uh, we development-wise often use the JavaScript on blur event. Uh, the on blur event is basically when the form field that user that currently have focus loses focus. So that would be when the user clicks out of the form field, typically into the next form field, or taps into the next form field with their keyboard. That's a common way of doing it, but it's actually not a very good way of doing it because it's uh, we as web professionals... Uh, we often know that there is such a thing that if you defocus a form field, then that would typically be a trigger for an order detection event. But no normal web user think this way. Normal web users will not, when they are in a postal code field and have typed all the five digits for their zip code, try to click on a random spot on the page just to see if some hidden magic uh, order detection event will be fired and then return uh, some values. Most users don't have this, uh, 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 this technical insight. So we see that users will typically not click on a random spot on the web page just to see if an, uh, some kind of hidden magic will, will uh, all of a sudden appear. So a much better way of doing this is actually firing the order detection event the second 
the expected character length is reached. So for a US zip code, that would be the second the user have typed the fifth character in the, in the form field, then we fire the auto detection event instead of waiting for the onboard event. Despite all of the benefits with auto detection city and regions based on the postal code, we see that it is 60% of the largest e-commerce sites in the world that do not auto detect city or region based on the user zip code. Then the last detail is that if you hide the fields, as you saw in this example, if you hide the fields, then it's very important they're expanded below the trigger. So they're expanded below the postal code field and not above it, even if above it would be, it would better match the conventional format of an address in the local country the user is shipping to. Uh, the reason it's important to add them below is that this is not data that the user have typed or selected themselves, so they need to be able to verify it. And we've seen testing users would typically not look backwards in the form while still typing it to see if new data were automatically added. So data we automatically add, we have to always add below the trigger. All right, that was some words on uh, the bulk of, of the address typing. But most checkout flows actually ask not for one address, but they ask for two different addresses, billing address and shipping address. We've obviously uh, also tested this quite extensively. And we see that for B2C sites, showing the billing fields by default is needlessly intimidating. Here you see a user. This user had, just at the prior checkout step, completed their entire shipping address and are now asked for their credit, tie, credit card method or credit card information. That's fine, that's fair. But then after that, they see some additional six or seven form fields that ask for their billing address while the user just typed their shipping address. For most B2C sites, this will be needlessly intimidating because for most B2C orders, the billing address will equal the shipping address. Then you might say, well, there is a button there. The user can just click use my address. Fair enough. The user actually don't have to do any typing assuming they spot that checkbox. They don't have to actually do any typing themselves. That's accurate. But when users land on this page, if they scan or once they progress to those fields, it will still appear very, very intimidating. This page contain around 10 form fields while the user actually only have to complete form form fields making the page appear needlessly intimidating. So what's very important when we talk about uh, billing versus shipping addresses is that typically for B2C sites, we want to default the billing address to equal the shipping address. So pre-checking that checkbox, but not only that, quite some sites do that, uh, is very important that when that checkbox is ticked, then all of those billing address form fields are hidden entirely. They're not just disabled and grayed out, and they're not just pre-filled for the user. We need to hide them entirely. That's important. Hiding them obviously reduce how intimidating the page will appear. Even pre-filled form fields will still make the page appear more complex than it actually is. But we also see that these pre-filled form fields actually introduce quite a lot of ambiguity. Because if the checkbox is ticked and these form fields are pre-filled, if the user then go in, goes in and edit the address or spots a typo that they correct, is it then the shipping address that will be submitted as billing or is it the edited billing address that will be submitted? That's unclear. <laughs> then for disabled form fields, we see that disabling and graying out form fields is largely a concept that normal web users simply don't get. It's surprisingly difficult for users to understand the concept of a disabled form field and it's highly frustrating for them because Usually, they have a difficult time figuring out how they then enable the form fields, frantically trying to click these disabled form fields. So we see why we as web professionals typically know you have to look somewhere else on the page, typically to enable editing of the form fields. Users, normal web users, typically don't have these technical insights and find them highly confusing and frustrating. So it's a much better approach to hide the fields entirely a small detail here you actually don't see it depicted on this screenshot, and that is if 
the billing address is used for verifying the credit card, so it's used as part of the credit card verification process, then it will be a good idea to then relay the used shipping address as text. So users can see what billing address are they submitting here with their credit card. In Baymart Premium, we will find a lot, or actually two different guidelines that relate directly to how we better indicate you, to users that the billing address is also used as a, a credit card verification address because there is a lot of details around that. But we'll not cover it right now. Then a nuance here is that, uh, so it's hopefully pretty clear by now, we should only ask for one address. But which of these two addresses should we then ask for? We actually see testing that the billing address should equal the shipping address as a rule of thumb. That is, you ask your users to type the shipping address and you then default the billing address to equal that. And the reason you want to do it this way is that the concept of a billing address is actually somewhat difficult to understand for some users. And that's actually not... Uh, uh, that strange that it's difficult to understand because what is a billing address used for? It actually differs quite a lot from site to site and it's often not very clear. On some sites it's used exclusively for invoicing purposes. On some sites it's actually used to calculate the sales, site, sales tax and on other sites, but certainly not all, it's used to verify the credit card data. There's no consistent usage for billing addresses on checkout flows online. Hence users don't have any consistent expectations and therefore, it's often far better that we ask them for the address that most users intuitively understand, and that is the shipping address. Then furthermore, if you cater to an international audience where some of that audience will be uh, users who don't have English as their first language, when we test with this segment of users, we see that they typically also have a lot easier time uh, understanding the word shipping address than compared to the word billing address. So that's another subtle detail there. So that was some, some findings on the uh, how users actually complete their address input. Then let's move on to another input. Let's talk a bit about account creation, because on some sites this is also part of the checkout flow. Regardless whether account creation is actually optional or required, we see that users still have a very high level of perceived friction associated with the act of creating account if that account is created upfront in the checkout flow. So regardless whether it's an optional created account or a required created account, if it's created upfront, we see that users have a tendency to associate all of the following form fields to the account creation. So what would often happen is that when users here in the beginning of the checkout flow creates an account, then the form fields on the following pages, users often associate it to be caused by that account creation as in there is a very high level of perceived friction. The reason I call this perceived is if we actually stop and think about it, how many extra form fields do a user who creates an account actually have to complete versus a user who performs a guest checkout? What are the actual number of extra form fields? It's actually only one to two form fields that are extra, right? It's only password and repeat password that are the extra pieces of information because the shipping address, the email, the name, and the credit card information, we need all that information for guest users as well. So it's literally only the password and repeat password we need for users who want an account versus those who just want a checkout, uh, a guest checkout. But that doesn't actually matter what the reality here is. What matters is how users perceive the act of creating an account upfront. And they associate, we see that quite consistently in testing, they associate or assume that all of these form fields they're seeing now here in the checkout flow is because they are creating an account, even when that is not the fact. This issue leads to a design pattern, another way of, of exposing users to account creation. At Baymart, we call this design pattern delayed account creation. And this design pattern accomplished the task of making optional account creation feel just like the one to two extra form fields that it actually is. The design pattern looks like this. So the user starts in the checkout flow, and then they're exposed to either signing in or only continuing as a guest. When they continue as a guest, here you see the, uh, the, the, the form fields, 
and then at the very end of the checkout flow, after having actually completed the order, you see that screenshot here on the right hand side, thank you for your order, only then do we present the option of creating an account. Here, and very importantly, embedding the two password fields directly on the thank you for your order page. It's very important that you don't surface this option only as a link on the thank you for your order page, because again, there will be a high level of perceived friction when it's only a link. Then users will assume they have to, com have to complete a lot of form fields when they actually only have to complete these one to two fields. So we want to show them directly how simple is this task. That is the concept of the late account creation. And we see that this have many benefits. Uh, first and foremost, it takes the whole question and the whole friction point of accounts out of the checkout flow, meaning we have a checkout flow that focuses only on closing the sale. Then once we have closed the sale, we can focus on other possibly very important uh, strategic tasks such as creating accounts, but probably for most e-commerce sites and most businesses, secondary tasks to actually closing a sale. So once the sale is then locked in, we can then focus on this very important secondary task, which is getting users to sign up for an optional account. Furthermore, the option of doing it here is that we then just uh, default all the order details to uh, the account details. Uh, but if you want a high opt-in rate, there are some important implementation details here. Uh, so what you see on the right-hand side is that we see in testing that this point, the thank you for your order page, is then the ideal position to then also highlight what are some of the benefits of signing up for an account. So if you actually want to increase the opt optional opt-in rate for account creation, then beyond delayed account creation, we also want to highlight what are the benefits. Easier checkouts uh, in the future, sometimes better capabilities for tracking your order, uh, sometimes the invoices are stored, which makes it easier to use as warranty information. Uh, and what are the benefits there might be to having an account at your specific site? Any loyalty programs you have would be obvious. That's one important implementation detail. Then another important implementation detail is that a small, small, small subgroup of users will upfront, when placing the order, a new order at a new site, know that this is a the site they want to return to. So to address their concern, we in the beginning of the checkout flow will want to state where you select guest checkout. We'd want to state that there is an opportunity to create an optional account at the end of the checkout flow. So these users who will be looking for this option know or have a chance of knowing where to find that option. So that's the concept of delayed account creation. If you have payment premium access, this is guideline 638, as you see here in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, where you will find a lot of additional implementation details and a lot of additional best practice examples. You'd find that for, for all of the things we've covered here, actually. So, let's do a sum up. We started with 16 form fields. How are we actually doing now? Well, we're actually down to just eight form fields that are visible by default. So that is a 50% reduction in the default visible fields because we now have a single full name, we still have email, we still have phone, then we only have address line one, address line two is collapsed, city name is auto detection, company name is collapsed behind a link, then we still ask for the postal code, then the region input uh, is auto detected based on the postal code, then country, uh, we still need that, Country, in either cases, would typically, though, be pre-filled by uh, IP geotargeting. Uh, we, though, typically don't want to use IP geotargeting for detecting city names. There's a longer explanation for that. If you have pay my premium access, again, you can look up the, the country-related guidelines uh, for that. The coupon code would, for most sites, also be an optional minority field, so that's also collapsed. Credit card number we still show, security code number we still show, and password and repeat password are now taken out of the checkout flow and delayed until the thank you page. So this is how we uh, can reduce and why we can reduce a 16 form field checkout flow to an eight form field checkout flow. Then some users who have more data or in, or in a special segment will have to complete additional fields, but the majority of users will only be exposed to these eight form fields. So that was what I want to cover in this presentation. Uh, for reference here, we covered uh, roughly 
half a percentage of the research findings we have in Baymont Premium. And they are mainly, what we cover here, mainly located within this topic, customer and address information. My name was Christian Holst. I hope you have found this presentation valuable.